the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some people don't believe that. I used to have a fellow follow me on the radio. He was one of these Jesus-only kind of people, you know, that thought there wasn't any Father and there wasn't any Holy Spirit, that just Jesus only. But God's Word says, Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We constantly find Jesus praying to the Father. And we have Jesus saying, if I go away, I'll send you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So God is a trinity. Three sinister beings must be recognized as the chief actors in the time of the end. It's amazing when you study the Bible how often you find the devil counterfeiting what God has done. So many similarities, one good and one evil. But at the time of the end, the last great drama of life, we do find three sinister characters. They're called the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. The devil is the author of all evil. He gives his power and his seat to the Antichrist. And the false prophet is dedicated to the proposition of serving the Antichrist and causing people to worship the Antichrist. Now this will take place during the tribulation period. Get this real straight in your mind that the Antichrist will not be revealed until after the rapture of God's people. I hear folks arguing about who the Antichrist is going to be. <clears throat> God didn't tell us. I have them arguing, I hear them arguing about who the two witnesses are going to be. Not a man on earth could prove it. I'm not interested in who he's going to be. I'm interested in who Christ is. And I'm interested in my relationship with Christ. And I, I, I want to know, I want to have some knowledge of these other things, but uh, I don't know who the Antichrist is going to be, but he's going to be a par powerful character because of the fact that the devil is going to give him his power and his seat and his authority. These are very clearly distinguished in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. And also Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And the beast was taken. Now the word beast, like the devil is called by many names. He's called the devil and Satan and the great red dragon and, and Beelzebub. And he's called by many names. Uh, even so in the book of Daniel especially, in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist is called by different names. And when it refers here to the beast, the beast of prophecy is the Antichrist of prophecy. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. By the way, sometimes the false prophet is called, called a beast also, but there is a distinction made between the two. The beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Now notice it says the beast and the false prophet were cast alive into the lake of fire. Now even though the Antichrist is called a beast, remember he is a man. Ephesians calls some men dogs and says, beware of dogs. But he's not referring to the kind of dogs you and I think of. And the Antichrist is going to be a man and the false prophet's going to be a man. And says that both of these, the beast and the false prophet, will be cast alive into the lake of fire. And then it says, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. At last, I believe, is Revelation 20 and 10. 
Now let's concern ourselves first with the devil. I don't think we ought to overly spend our time discussing the devil. On the other hand, we are living in an age of demon worship. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of churches, so-called in the world today, who worship Satan. I read Satan's Bible, the one they call the Devil's Bible, the one they use in that cult. I read it one night in my motel room. Every once in a while I got up and looked behind the door. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the things that you find in there, and I'll just put it this way. The things that are in there, some of them, I wouldn't dare mention to this mixed audience, the things that they do. And they're becoming very popular. And there are thousands of members of these churches. But I want us to concern ourselves first of all with the devil, that diabolical personage who for so many thousands of years has been the god of this world. We ask, who is the god of this world? Now don't misunderstand me. The god of this people that's here tonight, most of you, is our blessed god that's in heaven. But the god of this world is the devil. And he's called the god of this world. If the gospel be hid, I'm quoting from the word of God. If the gospel be hid, it's hid to those whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, lest the glorious light of the Son of God should shine in. That's the devil. That's Satan, and that's the kind of business he's engaged in. Now, several things we need to understand about the devil. First of all, the devil, unlike God, is a creature of time, not eternity. Some people may imagine that the devil's always existed just as God has always existed. But this is not true. The devil was created. He was created. We'll explain that a little later on. And he hasn't always been the devil. He held a very high, exalted position at one time. When he was first created, he was created as one of the cherubims. He was called the cherubim that covers, whatever that means. But he was an, a beautiful creature, an exalted creature, and he was a cherub or an angel. He was appointed to a position of very high authority. I think he probably might well have been, because God had the angelic host divided in positions of authority, some were just angels. Cherubims were exalted angels. But I think that you might, you might find, if you study the scripture carefully, that the devil in all probability held the highest position among the angels, was exalted to a very high position, and this was part of his undoing. He was appointed to this position, authority, by the, the Lord himself. How long he remained in this position is not known. But it is certain that once, that he was once one of the greatest of God's created angels. If you have your Bible, turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 19. And listen very carefully to the reading. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the ox, and the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Now listen. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, God says. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. 
Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. The statement here made is a little difficult to understand because we have a vague knowledge, a vague understanding of eternity. And because what we see here, God does what he does so many places in the Bible, he uses a type. But he says so much that could not apply to any man that's ever lived on the face of the earth. He says, thou wast in Eden. So many other things, so that we know that this goes far beyond the king of Tyre, who is here in this particular portion set forth as a type of the Antichrist. And there were many similarities between the things that happened to this king. But he was really referring to the devil himself. I said Antichrist, I meant the devil. Now let's look at this scripture, what it says for just a moment. First of all, in verses 14, 16... It says he was a cherub and that he was exalted above all. And God said, I did it. I did it. Second, in his unfallen state, he was the wisest of the wise and the most beautiful of the beautiful. Verses 12 and 13. Because of your beauty, he said. It brought pride to his heart and then because of his love of power, he tried to exalt himself above the Lord. He wanted the authority that only God had. And it was this pride and this beauty that brought him down. And third, he was perfect. Verse 15, he was perfect in his ways before God. And then fourth, he radiated light and indescribable brightness. Now, all of this is incorporated in the passage of Scripture that I read to you. A moment ago. But now I want you to look at another passage that describes Satan. And I want you to see him and what God has done. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 17. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Here we find something else. The other scripture said he fell from the mountain of God. This scripture says that he fell from heaven. Here he is named Lucifer. Because he's referring now to him after the fall. And he is named Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, listen, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the midst, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. That was his ultimate ambition. He wanted actually to dethrone God. He wanted to become the supreme ruler. He coveted power. You know... I wouldn't be very far off if I were to tell you that many, many a person since Satan fell has also fallen because of their self-ambition and their desire for power and authority. The Bible says, He that exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. But it's God that does the exalting, not man. When we exalt ourselves, God puts us down just like he did Lucifer. <clears throat> or the devil. I'll be like the Most High God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. 
to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? I want you, I want to straighten out one thing that's seemingly taught and believed by a great many people. We even saw it in the film that we had here some time ago on the burning hell. The picture that many people have in their mind is the devil in hell gleefully tormenting people. That this will be his ultimate, the height of his ultimate joy is when in hell he'll go about tormenting people forever and ever. I want to tell you one thing. If there's anybody or any created being that's going to suffer in hell, the devil is. The Bible says, I'm going to bring you down to ashes. That referred to being cast into the fire. The devil's not going to be around tormenting you. He's going to be gnashing his teeth for pain. He's going to be suffering the intense heat of the fire and brimstone. He's going to be paying for all of his sin when he tried to exalt himself to be like the Most High God and God cast him down. When he dared to say, I will. In the wrong context. Some things we ought to say, I will. We can say, I will do my best to have 1,700. But when you reach the place where you say, I will exalt myself above the most high God. You've got a heart full of pride. I will. He manifested that spirit of rebellion, which today is hurling people into destruction. You know why America's in the condition it's in today? Because of so many rebellious people. They rebel against God today, just like Satan did. We'll not have this man to rule over us. And the people are not saying it, but this is the philosophy of their life. The very essence of sin is a desire to be independent. We've talked so much about independence the last few years. And the pe people have gotten a complete misconception of what independence is. There's no such thing as a person who's completely independent. One preacher said, I'm a dependent independent. I'm an independent Baptist, but I'm dependent on other preachers and other people. We share a world together. We share lives together in the home. I'm dependent on my wife for so many things. I'm dependent on my associates here at the church. I couldn't pastor the church if I didn't have them. We're not independent. And I'll tell you, that's what the prodigal son wanted. He wanted to be independent. He didn't want his dad to rule over him. He wanted to be free to do what he pleased. Sins of transgression of the law. Sin is desiring to do your own way, your own will, in your own way. I want to do as I please. I don't want anybody telling me what to do till we've had a spirit build up in our country today that's anti-policemen. I have just as little respect for them as I could possibly have for anybody that will flaunt authority. It was God that created authority. He's added in every, every area of his creation. He placed authority among people here upon this earth. Even the home is divided up. And there's a chain of authority in the home. God placed it there. There's a chain of authority in the, in the church. I don't like all the laws that I have to obey. But since they are laws that Mike remade, I obey them. I think some of the laws are unnecessary. I think they have some little flimsy laws, but most of the laws of our country are very essential. 
Believe me. But it's when we reach that place that we rebel against that authority. And we want to be independent. And we want to do what we please, regardless of how it affects other people. We become selfish. As I've said many times, get all you can and can all you get. You're not concerned about other people. The welfare of other people. Satan had reached that place. And he said, I will. And that spell is downfall. When you say, God, I'll exalt myself above thee. Look out. You have a competitor that's greater than you. And I admit the devil is powerful, but thank God the one I serve is more powerful. He that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. I'm glad I have one in me that's greater than the devil. I meet the devil every day. I never have seen him, I've felt him. I've felt his presence. I've seen the influence that he's wielding in the lives of people that I deal with, I've even felt his influence in my own life. But I'm glad there's one in me that's greater than Satan. I'm glad God has all power. Satan is powerful, but God is all powerful. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I will spell sin. In Isaiah chapter 53, it says, We have turned... Everyone to his own way. That was describing the condition of the world. It says he was bruised for our iniquities. It said the chastisement of our peace was upon him. But he said we have turned to our own ways. We haven't listened. Many people today have their ears and their minds closed to God. They're not listening to God. They don't want to listen to God. They want to listen to their own whims, their own way, their own philosophy. I will. Is Satan mad? You make no mistake about it. Satan has undertaken a great many things that he's failed at. He's the arch enemy of God and he's the arch enemy of man. He hates God and he hates the people of God and is fully dedicated to their ruin. I wish I could get that over to you tonight. The devil wants to ruin you. The devil's the one that keeps you in your seat, lost person. When you hear the voice of the Spirit of God saying, Come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. It's the devil that says, Wait, wait. He's the author of procrastination. God says, Today, the devil says, Wait. And waiting is the sin that has dragged millions into hell. If I could uncap hell tonight, millions would say, I didn't intend to come here. I just waited too long. I intended to be saved, but I waited too long. Now, the devil doesn't lose any time. He sees and grasps the first opportunity in Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And then Eve eats of the fruit, listening to Satan accepting what he says instead of what God said, and gives to her husband, and he did eat, and the entire human race fell. By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The whole human race, all of the posterity of Adam fell, because man listened to Satan. God said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Satan said, God knows the day you eat thereof, you shall not surely die. You'll be made wise, even as God. And man said, that sounds good. Say more. 
And the next thing you know, man disregarded what God said and heeded the voice of Satan. And hence the condemnation of the entire human race. Now at last, Christ is born into the world. Many years have gone by, and oh, if you know anything about the history of Israel, you know the wars they fought, you know the times they were in slavery, you know how Satan worked on them, how Satan inspired an old king to try to kill all the baby boys born to the Israelite women, trying to destroy the posterity through which the Savior was to be born. When they sent out a decree down in Egypt to kill all of the baby boys that were born to Israelite families. The old king's determination was to try to, to stop the growth of this nation that was multiplying so fast and become a threat to them. But behind, the, behind all of that was a sinister plan that Satan had put in the heart of that king because Satan knew to destroy the posterity of Israel would have made it impossible for prophecy to have been fulfilled. Because Jesus was to be born through the seed of Abraham, through the seed of David. Christ came into the world. and the, One of the first things that Satan did, he worked through a king again and tried to destroy Christ. He too made a decree that all male children's two-year-old and under would be killed. And I'll not describe it to you because it's the most blood-curdling story I've ever read in my life. But if you'll read the historical accounts, not just in the Bible, but in other, in, in other writings, and you'll read what actually took place during that period of time when they were killing little babies for one reason and one reason alone. That was to try to destroy Jesus Christ. They'd heard he had been born, that he was going to be king. And the old king said, we'll destroy him. We'll get rid of him. Three times, Satan strikes at him. I think perhaps Satan may have coveted his position. Because he never got rid of that pride that was in his heart. I want to be like the Most High God. Now there was one like the Most High God. Jesus was born in the very nature of God. He was God manifest in the flesh. And so Satan set about to try to destroy him. But three times he was hurled back. At Christ's birth he tried to kill him. At Calvary, Christ is bruised, but not silenced. I always get a real, real blessing in my heart, always breaks my heart. I don't think I've ever heard the song that I didn't weep about that song that represented Christ that was being played. And man didn't like it, and man won't destroy it, and man finally took it and nailed it to a cross. And then the music stops. And then suddenly, the music begins playing again. And if you know anything about the Bible, you know what it says. They took the Son of God and nailed him to a cross. Then the world said, he's dead. He's dead. But after three days and nights, he appeared back on the scene. He rose from the dead and came forth with the keys of death and hell in his hand and said, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. As I live, so shall you live. The guarantee of our resurrection was his resurrection. And he has the key not only of the grave, but the key to hell. Well, before the throne of God, he brazenly accuses the followers of the Most High. Just as he accused Job so long ago. 
I don't know whether you realize this or not. Satan has access now into heaven. Some people would deny this, but I can prove it. He had access into heaven in the days of Job. And over in the book of Revelation, it says he's going to be cast out of heaven as the accuser of the brethren. He accuses you before God. That's why I'm so glad I have an intercessor. He's my heavenly attorney. He's called our advocate. The devil says, look down the old bill down. Look at the weakness of the flesh. Look what he's doing. Jesus t steps up and says, look at these nail prints. He pulls aside his robe and says, look at this scar on my side. I died for Bill Dow. I took his place. I accepted his guilt. I died the just for the unjust and old Satan's already gone. Jesus has the answer for every accusation that he makes against a child of God. But he's still the accuser of the brethren. He was in the days of Job. Job 1, 6 to 11. Now therefore was a day, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect man, and an upright man, and one that feared God and eschewed evil? That was God's estimate of him. But Satan said, Doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, he accuses God of paying Job to be the faithful servant that he was. Does Job serve God for naught? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Quite an admission for Satan to make. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand and touch all that he hath and he'll curse thee to thy face. That's what, that's what the, the devil said. The devil said, the only reason Job is serving you is because you build it around him. Does he serve God for naught? I want you to know the Lord said to him, you can go down and take anything he has away from him except his life. And he did. He took away his children. He took away his cattle. He caused his body to be covered with sores. His wife came to him and said, curse God and die. And the old devil slipped around and said, Aha, Job, how do you feel about it now? And old Job, through his misery, looked up and said, Naked came I into the world, and naked shall I depart from the world. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the devil said, But look at, your, look at your body. Look at the skin worms devouring the very flesh upon your body. Through his misery, old Job looked up and said, Oh, the skin worms. Destroy my flesh, yet I shall stand in flesh and see the Lord. Amen. He didn't lose his faith through it all. Thank God one day God's going to cast that accuser down. He'll no longer have access to accuse the brethren. Revelation 12, 10 says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. But thank God his time's short. That's one thing I'm proud of, and I, I, I say to him every once in a while, I've said it out loud. I've got to involve the old devil tried to hinder me so much, I turned around and said, you old devil, go ahead, do your worst. Your time's short. God's going to take care of you. You may cause me a lot of torment, you may cause me to stumble and fall once in a while, but God's going to take care of me, and he's going to take you too before long. His time is short. He's coming to his end. He'll be the source of power and authority during the tribulation period. The tribulation period is that period after the rapture of the saints and 
the beginning of the millennial kingdom upon earth. Approximately a seven year period that we call in the scripture calls a tribulation period. And during that period, he's going to be the source of power and authority. In Revelation chapter 13 and 2, the beast, that's the Antichrist. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The dragon referred to there as Satan, the great red dragon. He's identified later. But he'll be cast into the bottomless pit during the thousand year reign of Christ and into the lake of fire at the close of that reign. He not only be, has been brought down to earth, he, he's going to be brought down to hell. As I read from the scripture a little while ago, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid a hold on that old dragon, the, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up and sealed, set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loose for a little season. Right at the close of the tribulation period. Revelation 21 to 3. Now during the tribulation there will be a period of persecution and suffering so terrible, so relentless that all others will pale into insignificance. Man thinks he's suffered. He knows nothing about suffering. If you've ever read the scriptures that describe the tortures and the torment of the people of this earth, the unbelieving people of this earth during the tribulation period. You know a little bit of what I'm talking about. The leader in that day will be the Antichrist with all the power of Satan and with Satan's seat. And the scripture tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 12, he will oppose God. What's the Antichrist going to do? First, he's going to oppose God. He always has. Since his fall, he still will, only increasingly so, as we near the end. Then he will exalt himself. That's what he tried to do in the beginning. And he fell from the heavenly state. But now again, during the tribulation period, he's going to exalt himself. Say, so you can't even buy or sell unless you have my mark on you. The mark of the beast. He's going to exalt himself. And then... He will seek to take the place of Christ. He's going to sit in the temple claiming to be God. And literally millions of people after the rapture of God's people, literally millions of people are going to believe in the Antichrist as their Christ. And they're going to follow him. God's going to send them strong delusions. A lot of people think they'll be saved after the rapture takes place. Not if you've heard the gospel, you won't. The Bible says God's going to send strong delusions so that they will believe the lie, that is, the lie of the Antichrist, and they'll follow him. Now, he's going to make a covenant with the Jews. This is something we're watching very carefully. I think everybody that knows the Scripture. He's going to make a covenant with the Jews, but will later break that covenant and persecute them as they've never been persecuted before. And I preached on that last Sunday night. Daniel chapter 9 verse 22 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's a week of years. And in the midst of the week. He makes the covenant for seven years. But in the midst of the seven years. He will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he'll make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Daniel 9, 27. He's going to make a covenant with the Jews, and they're going to rebuild their temple. But in the midst of the tribulation, he's going to break that covenant and... You know that how the red dragon's going to chase the children of Israel during the tribulation period and God's going to pro provide a place for them. They're going to be hid from Satan and from Satan's power. It's described very clearly in the book of Revelation. 
Now, Satan's going to be a great warlord and gain world dominion. Revelation 13, 4 says, And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Listen. Who can make war with him? He's the ultimate as a warrior. He's the ultimate as a warlord. And people draw back in fear, like the children of Israel when the spies came back and told them the people were too strong and the cities were too fortified. They draw back in fear. Who can make war with the beast? And they give over to him. He takes over world control, becomes a worldwide dictator. Uh, during the tribulation period. Suddenly, the third in the evil trinity is brought upon the scene, the false prophet. Now listen, what's the difference in these two beasts? The main work of the false prophet will be to do the bidding of the Antichrist. Whatever the Antichrist wants, that which will exalt the Antichrist, is the main mission of the false prophet. In Revelation 13, 11 to 15, we're told that he'll build a great image to the beast or the Antichrist. I beheld another beast, not the Antichrist, but another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake like a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed and he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he hath power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. That was the Antichrist. And he had power, this second beast, the false prophet, had power... He wrought miracles before him, in which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and which worshipped his image. But it says he had power to both to speak and to cause that dumb image, that image that he made unto the beast to speak. You know, a lot of folks nowadays, they say, oh, this charismatic bunch and this, this bunch of people who believe they can perform all kinds of miracles. If people can perform miracles, it's bound to be of the Lord. Listen, about 90% of the miracles that are going to be performed in the last days are going to be performed by the devil, not the Lord. This beast is going to have power to call fire down from heaven. He's going to build an image and cause that image to speak. Notice their awful end. The beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the fire burning with brimstone. Now read Revelation 20 and 10. And the devil. We have the beast and the false prophet. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And after this, of course, will be the great white throne judgment. And all sinners will be resurrected and will stand before the great eternal God of vengeance and judgment. And the books will be opened, they'll be judged, and those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. That'll be one of the most terrible hours in all of human history when they're plunged over the precipice into the fiery depths of the eternal hell. And then following that, and I don't have time to discuss it, but it's glorious to think about. Following that, John said, and I looked. This is after the 20th chapter of Revelation. I looked, and I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then he says, God shall wipe away all tears from their faces. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. For the former things are passed away. God's here now. Christ is back with the people.